Hello everyone. Collecting stories from survivors of violence is a difficult process. Silence is often the first and most authentic response to violence by the victims. I have found this to be true in my work with women and children across the world. Minoli Salgado, an academic by training, by, but here a writer, returnee to Sri Lanka and, above all, a deeply sensitive listener, works with and through the silences that she encounters in the 12 victim survivors from Sri Lanka whose stories make up this book. This is part of the preface to this book, if I can show you. 12 Cries from Home in search of Sri Lanka's disappeared. And the preface from which I'm going to read you just a few, but just, just two or three more paragraphs, was written by Rathika Kumaraswami, who is the former Under Secretary General of the United Nations and Special Representative of Children and Armed Conflict. This is a book about this academic, Miss Salgado, going back to Sri Lanka where her parents actually came from originally. And um, about, uh, is, is she's going to interview victims of the civil war but um, she has a special way of listening because she you have to take into account when you are uh, interviewing these victims whose families have been killed or disappeared you have to be very careful not to go back to traumatize what they are saying so it's a special it's a special way of listening and she is throughout the book you can see she's very very good at it i thought i would read you one story one of the shortest ones because sometimes watching what is happening now in the world with all these wars and um, so many people experiencing not not only terror from being bombed, but um, you know hunger and all the rest of it. I I sometimes think, oh my goodness, I am not I'm not getting used to watching this. Am I? I'm an, I'm not being dehumanized. Are we? Are we? Sort of sometimes watching it as as voyeurs or something it's uh, it it bothers me so i i got this book in order to remind me about what victims of violence say about their experience um, which may be not about the bigger picture or oh, we were here and we were bombed all over the place but sometimes it's just in the little detail uh, Listen to it. Um, it won't be long, this video, I hope, but I want to share this with you. I continue with the preface. Uh, Twelve Cries from Home, which is the name of the book, is a travel narrative of literary witness that is, that is the first book to gather civilian testimonies from across the island in the wake of the Civil War. It draws into a world of fear and terror, punctuated by the author's journey through Sri Lanka's extraordinary landscape and the ease of its diversity when left alone to exist. The beauty and diversity of Sri Lanka is felt under your skin alongside a visceral connection to the torment of those whose family members have disappeared, the endless searching, the endless waiting, the endless pleading, the endless bribes, the endless visiting of camps and police stations, endless days in court and 
endless telling of their story, the appeal or call that ends. Have you seen my son? The beautiful prose lulls you into understanding, forcing you to reflect on and to savor the insights that attend each story. The book draws out individuals confronting and witnessing different forms of violence. Caught in between parties that use disparate forms of terror, the civilian is a victim survivor. We have the direct violence of such unbearable torture that it makes you curl up, wondering about the nature of the last hours of the person so tormented. There is murder, either in the form of assassination or being caught in the crossfire between combatant, combatants. There is sexual violence that the author acknowledges but leaves unspoken due to the need to keep faith with the speaker's need for privacy. There is bombing and shelling that makes the population scatter. And there is forced displacement where whole communities are made to leave behind everything they hold dear. The author's sensitivity to the possibility of re-traumatizing her witness, her consciousness of the devastating effects of these stories on her interpreter, and her acute awareness of the pitfalls and significance of her role as a witness bearer, all underscore the writing of the book. Indeed, 12 Cries from Home is driven by a humanity that provides moral anchor in a terrain where the darkest instincts reign free. Okay, let me move on now to the first, uh, one of the first stories. If you give me a second here. I, I'm picking and choosing a few paragraphs so as not to make this too long. This is the author speaking. I was sharing a meal with an Olympic poet from the Caribbean when she, when she was approached by a waiter who had been watching us from the sidelines. He was a young man in his twenties of African descent. He drew her to one side and spoke quietly to her, drawing out a mobile phone for her to see. She peered at the screen and I saw her face tighten in response. They spoke briefly before she hurried back to tell me of what had happened, speaking to me in harsh tones as though fearful of her own words. You are a poet the waiter had said. Can you please write a poem for my mother so that others can remember her? This is what I have of her. This is what is left. He carried the phone in his breast pocket, he said, to keep her close to his heart. He had then shown my companion a film clip on his mobile that had been sent to him by someone from his home village. The clip, the clip showed his mother being dragged from her home into an excited, shouting crowd. The crowd encircled her as she tried to escape. They then threw kerosene on her and set her on fire. His last sight of his mother is this vision of her screaming as the flames grew large. Meet, uh, this is sort of an introduction to the things that she's going to encounter. This is her first story. A Good Heart. She has a clear brow and clear eyes. Her hair is scooped back from a face that exudes calm. She greets me like an old friend and the warmth of her welcome almost hurts. My inner critic, 
steps in and reminds me that I need to hold back. Throughout this trip, the auditor in me will keep me in check. We begin with the formalities of consent and she indicates that she does not wish to be identified by her beautiful first name, but by her surname, the Hanayaki, instead. She tells me this is because her story is known and the perpetrators have suffered enough already. She does not wish to cause any more upset to the abductor's family. For the same reason, she does not wish her brother's abductors to be named. She knows exactly who they are. The two men who drew her, who drew her young brother from the bus to his almost certain death are brothers themselves. These abductors and are her neighbors. In a village of 400 families, everything is known. Anonymity, the kind that protects informers and killers, can be necessary in a telling of a tale. The Hanayaki continues to live in the village of her brother's abductors. She needs to make her own peace. He got on with everyone, she tells me on sitting down. My brother had a good heart. She uses the past tense. She does not expect to see him again. She is the oldest of seven children, five girls and two boys. The family was poor. They ate jackfruit as rice. Uh, they ate jackfruit as rice was too expensive. They did not have the money for her to study at university, though she was academic and had passed her A-level exams. Her youngest brother, Bandula, had also studied for his A-levels, though he had to give up his studies to get a job and help the family out. He had lost his job at the, at the Ever Ready Company in Colombo at the time of the incident and was doing gardening work and paddy field cultivation while living at home. Her father had died when she was a child, she says, wiping her eyes for the first time. Although they did not have much money, they, have, they had an abundance of love. Bandula, her youngest brother, was the beating heart of the family. A scamp, a mentor, the one everyone looked to for moral compass. He was above difference. He got on with everyone. He was thoughtful and planned ahead for the family. He had the capacity to make the present alive while, while looking to the future. Every Sinhala New Year, after the disturbed period known as Nonagathi, he was always the one chosen to eat the first mouthful of food in every house in the village. This is an honor only accorded to one with a good heart. As a child, he was the joker who would dress up in his mother's clothes. I am decided what looks best so that I can have many girlfriends who will help you with the housework, mother, he would say. He was a teller of tall tales. Whenever he was late from school, the family would relish the excuses he gave. Why, the bus crashed on the road and I spent a whole hour rescuing the passengers. I have been helping all these crash victims, so don't scold me for being late. <laughs> the incident that took him took place on the 29th of September 1989 when he was 20 years old. This was a bad period when bad things were taking place in this part of the country, the Hanayaki explains. Her notion of bad things covers the 40,000 or more disappearances that took place in the region. These disappearances were partly a result of abductions by the JVP, the insurgent group who were in control then. 
but more often the work of uh, clandestine para paramilitary groups who pledged to kill 12 people for every family member of the military killed by the JVP. Bandula had been standing at the Matara bus station with his older brother when two people from their village had got chatting to them and asked where they were going. His older brother had recently returned home from his work in Colombo and spoke without suspicion, as a man in Colombo might. He chatted freely and told the men that he was going with Bandula to visit their married sister who lived in Mbilipitiya and was expecting a baby. Bandula had wished to stay home, to stay in the family home where Dahanayiki and her younger sister were, to look after them as he'd been worried for their safety, but his brother had persuaded Bandula to join him, saying it would be safer to leave. The older brother, travelling down from Colombo and taking Bandula away from home at such a time, put suspicion on him, the Hanayaki explains. My older sibling was trusting, she says. This was a time when trust was a dangerous thing. So Bandula had got on to the bus with his older brother and was travelling on the road between the Vinuwara and Gandara when their bus was stopped by a car that drew alongside it. The car contained the two men from their village whom they had spoken to earlier. A man in civilian clothes got out of the car and boarded the bus, calling out, Where is Bandula? The older brother then understood that his brother was being taken in for questioning by the police. Dahanayaki is now animated. Her eyes stay calm, but her speech quickens as she takes me through her long search for Bandula. She tells me first of her older brother's frantic phone calls and inquiries at police, station, police stations and her own search that would absorb the family for 10 years. She speaks of her appeals at police stations and to the superintendent of police and a line of inquiry that took her to powerful ministers such as Mahinda Vijesekara and Mangala Samarawira. The police said they had no information on Bandula. Mahinda Vijesekara gave her a letter to take to the Matara army camp in the fort. The officers at the camp told them that people such as Bandula, who were taken in for questioning, might be at one of the two detention centers in the south, at Polhena or Matagedara, and to go and search there. The information on this search has been documented by the National Peace Council. The Hanayaki story splinters with memories that pull her in different directions and has me struggling to find a way through a clear path. I ask for further details and the Hanayaki describes her experience of entering an unfamiliar wor male world. How she went to the center for missing persons day after day to be told the same information again and again. At first the queue was so long it took her hours to be seen, so she learned to arrive at 4.30 in the morning to be ahead of the crowds. She arrived so early she was too tired to eat breakfast or prepare anything to take before she left home and fainted while waiting in the queue. She had also fainted on being told by her brother that Bandula had been abducted and taken away. She speaks of fainting as if it were a natural part of events. The same response, the same words each time, all confirming that her brother could not be found. A surreal experience. 
being informed that he cannot be found when she knows these have been, these have been searched everywhere. He must be somewhere, though. He cannot simply vanish and disappear. And the army must know where he is, as one of the brothers who informed on him was a military man. Where is Bandula? they had asked on the bus. This the question that snare him. The question that reverberates still. When she went to meet the local minister, Mahinda Vijasekara, he gave her papers that would take her to the Polhena detention camp, she says. This detail differs from the information provided by the NPC, but is incidental to the tale. What is striking is the emotional warmth with which she speaks when she describes her visit to the camp. The camp is in the village where I'm staying, but I had not been aware it existed till now. It is not for women to go on these searches, she says, but as the elder sister and with her mother away in Colombo, she has become strong. She smiles as she says this, and I follow her memory of a journey to her former self. On approaching the camp, she had been scared, but her inquiry about her brother gave her strength, and something in her eyes must have convinced the military men that this was a woman who would not give up easily. She was told there were no detainees there, and then taken across to the detention area. A door was open, and she was led into empty cells. She remembers they were about... 20 foot square, and from her expression, it seems she might remember the smell, or perhaps it is the stink of deception that she detects. It was a deliberate ploy, she says with knowing eyes. The empty cells were meant to convince her that the armed forces were as clean as the cells she saw. Her visit to the second detention camp was different. She was kept waiting at the gate and not allowed inside. She believes this is perhaps because there were no empty cells to be found. She then received a letter stating that her brother was not there. Three months on, after constant inquiry, she went to the center for missing persons but got no support. Worse, she was duped out of the meager funds she had when a peon to the minister asked her to bring 5,000 rupees, saying that he would then ensure that she met her brother. She went with the money, a cooked meal and a sarong for Bandula, domestic things that might call him, that might call him home. She was hopeful she would see him as she had heard he was alive. She had spoken to a former prisoner of one of the detention camps, a man who had been hospitalized after torture, who said he had seen her younger brother in the camp. The meal and the money were taken by the peon who left her waiting for hours, with only Bandula sarong in her hands. She waited for hours and hours, and in the end the peon came back. He said she would, she would not be able to see her brother that day, but should return another day with 10,000 rupees. She returned with the money on the prescribed day, but refused to give it up without seeing Bandula first. I will give you any amount of money, she said, 10, 20, 50,000 rupees, but I need to see him first. The peon then told her she would not be seeing her brother that, th that day. Later, she discovered that he had fleeced others with the same ruse and had illegally acquired 25,000 rupees. This crime was reported, but he has never been charged. It is no use going to the police, she says. 
I ask about justice in a land where the upholders of the law are the ones who break the rules. I ask about how she feels about the neighbours who falsely informed on a brother who had avoided politics. How does she live beside them? And how exactly have they been punished, as she claims? Her eyes are clear and steady and calm, and she invokes a sense of a cosmic, cosmic order to things. One of the village brothers who had informed on him joined the army and was killed by a landmine, she says. The family have suffered already. They have already paid a price. The other brother who informed on Bandula does not talk to them anymore and cannot look them in the eye. He's not a bad person, she says. He is just jealous. He thought if my younger brother stayed in the village, he would develop our family. And despite everything, we have done well. I have lost my fear. Nothing scares me now. I reflect on this family tragedy into which she has woven a happy ending. And the fact that she draws sustenance from close-knit ties including the support of her mother's brother, who was the first to help them. I then wonder at her choice of name. By choosing to identify herself by her family name, the Hanayaki has ensured that hers is the family story. The suffering, the triumph over it, is not personal. It belongs to them all. She has drawn compassion from a well of suffering. So when I ask if she has a, me a message for outsiders to the land, I have expect to hear words that resonate with an eternal truth. She takes a while to think about my question, mentions the need for a proper investigation, and keeps revising her words as if trying to come to a statement that will be adequate to her thoughts. She then says, tell them that an educated people should not be allowed in the army. I recognize the indirect accusation and its Buddhist subtext. The belief that wrongdoing is the result of ignorance and a cloudy mind, and wonder how this statement will be received by Western readers, then realize that her small request contains a larger idea. It, in it is enshrined the most basic of human rights, the right to security, the right to life. Specifically, the right not to be abducted, tortured and killed by those who are meant to protect you. And this is uh, one of the first stories in the book. Thank you for listening. Bye bye.